Together with my colleague, Professor Guy McCusker, we teach functional programming. This is an interesting mathematical way of programming. It teaches you many interesting things, such as recursion, and it lets you use other aspects of programming, like data structures, in a very natural way. In this lecture, Professor McCusker will introduce the basics of Haskell, the functional programming language that we use in our teaching. Hello and welcome to Functional Programming. I'm Guy McCusker and in this first session we're going to talk over briefly what the course is going to be about and we're going to take a look at the basic building blocks of Haskell, which is the language we'll be using in this course. So what is Functional Programming about? Well, it's about a different way of programming. In functional programming, rather than writing commands that change the values of variables, which mean the information stored in the computer's memory, instead we write with functions. That means we define functions that take inputs and produce certain outputs, and then we apply those functions to particular inputs in order to do the computations that we're going to want to do. And because of the interesting ways that you can define functions and apply them to one another, you're able to program in a completely different style than what you've maybe been used to in things like Java and Python and so on. So we're going to study a particular programming language, which is Haskell, but most of what we're talking about would apply in many functional programming languages and moreover in other kinds of programming languages that allow you to program in a functional style, which is more and more common nowadays. So you can program in a functional style in Python if you want to, you can program in a functional style in Rust, and the ideas and the thought processes that you go through when designing functional programs are applicable in all kinds of programming uh, environments. And as well as learning to program in this language, we're going to study a mathematical theory of functional programming, a thing called the lambda calculus, which dates back to the early 20th century. So it predates, not only predates Haskell, but predates computers themselves, which is quite something. So Haskell is a functional programming language. There are many of them. Lisp is one, Scheme is another, ML is another, and there are functional aspects in other modern programming languages. It has some particular features, Haskell, that we're going to make use of. So Haskell is, in particular, statically typed. What does that mean? It means that everything you see in Haskell, every piece of data and every function, comes together with a type. And those types are computed at compile times. So that's why it's called statically typed. They're not computed as the program runs. They're computed essentially when you write the program. And what that means is that the compiler is able to give you certain guarantees before you execute the program that certain things will go well, or it's able to give you errors saying this thing's going to go badly before you run the program so that you don't make certain mistakes. Haskell has an aspect called lazy evaluation that means that it doesn't do any computation that it doesn't absolutely have to. You can immediately see, I think, just from the description, the idea of that is to be efficient so that you don't waste time doing computations that are not used. But it has certain other consequences that uh, we'll get into as the course goes on. And Haskell is good for you. Its syntax is clean and beautiful. It allows you to express ideas, computational ideas, very cleanly, almost exactly as you would conceive of them. So we'll see today the idea of writing a recursively defined function and the way in which that's expressed in Haskell is very clean. We're going to spend quite a bit of time in this course thinking about the nature of recursively defined functions written to manipulate recursively defined data. And the syntax of Haskell supports a very clean mode of expression for these things. So you'll see as we go on that this cleans up your thought processes and that clarity of thought will transfer over to your programming in whatever language uh, that you prefer to use when you're not studying functional programming. So functional programming is about computing with functions. What are functions? Well, I would say that functions are mathematical objects that you think of as performing some computation. They take an input and compute some output from that. So here are a bunch of example functions. There's the function that squares a number. It takes some number x and gives you back x squared. So if you give it 5 as input, it gives you 25. Or you could have the function that adds 6 to a number. That takes x and gives you back x plus 6. So if you give it 3 as input, you get back 9. If you give it 9, you get back 12. So you can see that these are both functions, and you can see that they're different. There are more sophisticated or more mathematical, if you like, functions, like the sine function, trigonometric sine function. If you give it pi as input, it will give you 0 as output. 180 degrees, if you prefer, gives you 0 as output. And then here's a function that computes the length of a string. So if you give it a string like this, the string 13 characters for the input, it tells you 13 because it's measuring the length of the string, and there are 13 characters in the string 13 characters. 
those are what functions are and we're going to see how to write them but before we can define a function we're going to have to know about types types in Haskell are built up from the types of the basic data you use as the basic types and then build up more sophisticated types out of those so let's have a look at the basic data types in Haskell and see what uh, see what they are so we have a data type for truth values, true and false, which you use for your logic, you know, to decide whether something is true or false, to decide what to do, do this or do that, depending on whether something is true or false. So the truth values themselves are written like this. There's true with a capital T and false with a capital F. And these are booleans, and so their data type is this. It's bool with a capital B. So this is the Haskell type, and these are the values that inhabit that type. There are many ways in Haskell of working with numbers. So you can have typical, I guess, 64-bit signed integers, which range from minus 9, whatever this says, to plus 9, whatever that says, which is quite a big range. Uh, and this is the type called int. OK, so you have minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, all the way down to this, and 0, and 1, and 2, all the way up to this. But if that's not big enough for you, you can also use the Haskell type integer. So it's a different type with a lot of values in common with the int type, but these ones go on forever. So in principle, in Haskell, you can refer to a number arbitrarily large, and in particular, either below this one or above this one, and that's OK. But if you want to do that, you have to use this type integer. There are types for floating point numbers, you know, so fractional numbers, decimals, and uh, minus 1.2 times 10 to the minus 6 here. So those are the types of float and double. There are data types of characters. So this is the data type char with a capital C for characters, and those are written like this. So there's lowercase a, lowercase b, uppercase a, uppercase b, and you use the single quotes to wrap around those. And then double quotes, you can wrap around a string. So the string data type, which is you know familiar string data type that you see in, in many languages. OK, so we've got some basic data, and we've got basic data types. So far, so good, right? We're, this is the kind of thing that we're familiar with. But in Haskell, we're going to be working mainly with functions. What's the type of a function? Well, a function, its role is to take some input and give some output. So, for example, that function that measures the length of a string takes a string as its input and gives an integer as its output. So in Haskell, that would have a data type that looks like this. It says string arrow integer or string to integer. So this minus and greater than is supposed to go together to make an arrow. And this is a data type that says this is the type of functions that receive a string as input and provide an integer as output. The add six function, on the other hand, might take an integer as input and give an integer as output. So it would have a type that looks like this. And you can see that the types of functions are built up using the types of less sophisticated data, let's say, so here's strings and integers, and you put them together with this operator, the arrow operator that goes between the input type and the output type. So every function is going to have an input type and an output type, and when you put those together, you get the type of the function. So now we know how to write down the type of a function, how do we write an actual function? So in Haskell, if I wanted to write the function that adds 6 to an integer, I could write the following two lines. I would first write its type signature, because Haskell is statically typed, and I want to tell the compiler what the type of my function is. If I don't tell it, it will work it out for me. But it's good practice when you know what it is to tell Haskell what it is. So I declare I'm going to have a function called add6, and then these two colons mean, and here comes its type, and then here is the type. And the type says it takes an integer and gives me back an integer. So I've defined the function add6. And now I'm going to define what it does. So how does it compute? And the way in which you do that is you say, OK, add6 applied to some parameter x is going to be equal to x plus 6. So when you look at this, you can see various components. So you've got the function name here, the two colons, and then the type. That gives you a type declaration. And then the function name here, some parameters. Here, just one. And we'll come on to what you do if you want to have more than one parameter. Then an equal sign and the expression that you want to evaluate. So that's the basic shape of a function definition. Now looking at this, if I want to use a syntax like this, I have to, in one expression, write what the output of this thing is going to be. And of course, that's not normally possible. If you're writing a, an interesting program that does something kind of sophisticated, you're not going to write it all in one gulp. One thing that you might want to do is to take a look at the input you've been given and make some decisions on, do I compute this expression or do I compute that other expression to evaluate this function? And 
for doing that, Haskell gives you this notation of guards, which allow you to do conditional evaluation. So here I'm going to write a function called absolute, which computes the absolute value of an integer. So for 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, it just gives you back the number you put in. So absolute of 9 will be 9, absolute of 15 will be 15. And then for the negative integers, for minus 1, it's going to give me 1. For minus 5, it's going to give me 5, and so on. So the type of this is very straightforward. Absolute takes an integer and gives me back an integer. And now let's look at the way in which the function itself is defined. I say absolute is a function that takes some parameter x. And now I write these two guards. So when x is less than or equal to 0, the value of absolute x should be minus x, which is minus 1 times x. And otherwise, it's going to be equal to x. So what's going on here? We have these vertical bars, and the vertical bar says, here comes a guard, a condition that you have to uh, check, and you might go and evaluate the line that it's guarding, or you might not. What the compiler will do is it will take the x and say, OK, is this value x less than 0? And if it is less than 0, then we'll compute this. If it's not, it'll look at the next line. And you can have as many of these as you like. You don't have to have just two. You can have multiple guards. And the compiler will keep looking and keep looking until it finds a guard that's true, and then it will evaluate what's on the side of the corresponding equals. And then at the bottom, if you run into this otherwise line, that's a catch-all that says, if you've got here, then you definitely evaluate what's on the right of this equals sign. So when x is less than 0, you get minus x, so minus 9 becomes 9. And otherwise, you get x, so 15 becomes 15. A lot of what we're going to do in functional programming is going to involve recursively defined functions. And if I'm talking about recursively defined functions, I have to show you the factorial function. So here it is. You know what the factorial function does. Factorial of 5 is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 120. Factorial of 1,000 is an exercise for the reader. So factorial is a function that takes an integer and gives you back an integer. And when computing factorials, it's slightly sneaky because what do you do? What's the factorial of minus 5? I've given this thing the type of integers, and so I have to deal with negative numbers. What's the factorial of minus 5? Is it minus 5 times minus 6 times minus 7 and so on forever? Which doesn't make sense. I can't even decide if that's plus or minus infinity. Or what is it? So you could say it was undefined and throw an error. We're not going to do that. We're going to say for any value less than or equal to 1, the answer is going to be 1. And for everything else, this. And this expression, x times the factorial of x minus 1, involves a recursive function call. The value of factorial of x, when x is not less than or equal to 1, is going to be given by taking x itself and multiplying by the factorial of x minus 1. And so I just casually, like it's nothing, make a call to the same function that I'm defining. And Haskell is happy with that. This is perfectly fine. And it will be evaluated like this. If I say to Haskell, OK, tell me the factorial of 4, the compiler will say, OK, is 4 less than or equal to 1? No, it's not. So let's look at this line. I have to compute 4 times the factorial of 4 minus 1, which is 3. So this recursive call then has to evaluate this uh, expression again. But this time, the parameter x will be bound to 3 rather than 4. So the compiler will say, is 3 less than or equal to 1? No, it's not. So let's do this. You get 3 times the factorial of 2. And then this factorial 2 gets unwound to 2 times the factorial of 1. And now something different happens. In computing factorial of 1, the compiler will say, is 1 less than or equal to 1? And it is. And so that bottoms out. So factorial of 1 becomes 1. And look, we've got no more recursive calls. And there you go. You compute 24. That's how recursive functions are evaluated in Haskell. I just want you to take note of the simple, clean syntax, which looks very much like a mathematician might write. The expression matches the thought. That's the point. Another thing we need to be able to do is to have functions that take more than one argument. So for instance, the addition function takes two arguments and adds them together. And that's fine. This is the way you would define a function like that in Haskell. But what would its type be? What on earth is the type of the function add? I said that every function in Haskell has a type that looks like input, arrow, output. But this thing takes two kinds of input. So how can I deal with that? Rather than considering the function add, let's consider that function add 6. That has the type integer, arrow, integer, as we saw before. It takes a number and it adds 6 to it. So that's very straightforward. Think about this expression add 6, so add space 6, rather than this function add 6. I would claim that if I write down add space 6 and then apply that to 7, so I write add 6, 7, 
which will give me 6 plus 7, right? so give me 13. So this expression add of 6 behaves exactly like the function add 6 that we defined earlier. In that case, if it's exactly the same thing, it should have exactly the same type. So I claim that the expression add 6 should have type integer arrow integer. So if you buy that, then look at this. Add of 6, this thing, is the result of applying some function add to some integer 6. So that means that add must be a function that can take a value like 6 and give you back something of type integer arrow integer. So that means that add is a function whose input type is integer and whose output type is integer arrow integer. So the type of add will look like this. This says you give it an integer, it doesn't give you an answer straight away, what it gives you back is another function. And what does that function do? That function takes another integer, this is the y, and gives you back the answer. So it does the addition for you. So this type is what's called a curried function type. It's named after Haskell Curry, who is a logician who was involved in early work on the lambda calculus and those kinds of things. We're going to meet some of his other inventions later. And this is a way of understanding functions of multiple arguments as functions that receive their arguments one by one and return for you other functions. So the idea is that functions receive their arguments one at a time. And while there are still arguments to come, what you have is still something that's expecting an input. And so it must still be a function. So here's another way of looking at it. In Haskell, there is a function called max that takes two numbers and gives you back their maximum. So max of two and three times four is gonna compute the maximum value between two and three times four, and so that's gonna be 12. Max of two is something that can be given three times four and give you back an integer. So max of two has type integer arrow integer. And what that means is that max all by itself can receive an integer like two and give you back something of the form integer arrow integer. And so this is how curried functions work. Thank you for watching our lecture video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you would like to find out more, please go to our website. I hope to see you in Bath.